On the right hand side. Andrea Adelson, ESPN.com. Jim, you've talked a lot about exposure for football with ABC and having more of those windows. With the preseason expectations for Florida State and Clemson headed into this year, how important is it, do you feel, for the ACC to be able to capitalize on some of these bigger windows with some of its marquee programs to help change the perception and the narrative of the league? Good question, Andrea. I, I think for all of us, you get into the competitive ACC season and it's a little bit of a cannibalization. So your point of differentiation I think for all conferences ends up being the non-conference games. And so we have to get off to a really good start. It doesn't uh, negate having a really good season if you don't, but if you stumble once or twice, it's really difficult to overcome that. So you mentioned a couple of our teams and, and I think we have a whole host of others that also can have a really good season. And you know, sometimes our ranked teams act just like that and, and perform right off the gate in a, uh, in a high level, but sometimes those teams that aren't ranked or at the, maybe at the bottom of the top 25 really start to gel. So I'm really excited about it. I've had a chance to, you know, really dig in this summer about our rosters and, and um, love our coaches as always. But I think Andrea, with the, the schools you mentioned, you know, Florida State and Clemson getting a lot of opportunities. I think we have a bunch of others that can also get off to a good start and show that the league is a really, really good football league. And, and I mentioned in my remark about the CFP, I, I just think sometimes it's lost because of whatever narrative's out there. We're, we're second most in titles and appearances in the CFP. And I think that equates in modern day football to having success. We're going to take our second question from here in the middle section, second row. Royal Howell, Carolina Blitz. Uh, Commissioner, a year ago in this same room, you mentioned guardrails and mandating the NIL. Players seem to love it, but coaches seem to have a disgrunt about players being able to make money off their name, image, and likeness. Lane Kiffin recently mentioned college football college football being a complete disaster right now with the NIL. What are your thoughts on the college football as a whole and do you think it's just a disaster to have the NIL in totality? Yeah, uh, I, I think here is where uh, name, image, and likeness is, is off the track and that is what I described about Washington DC. For, for certain, there's, the student athletes deserve the opportunity um, to engage in name, image, and likeness. And I had a chance to address that group yesterday, and we've been a, a strong proponent of it. Where it's really difficult is these disproportionate state-by-state -state rules and legislation, and that's what we're trying to change. And I think as you look at the NCAA and the history of it, we've, we've kind of all raised our right hand and indicated, hey, we'll follow these rules. We may not like all of them, but we'll follow them. But the current NIL legislation is so disproportionate about what you can do in one state versus another state. And I think that's part of the frustration that our, that our coaches are, are faced with. And so having something, some kind of federal legislation that allows some opportunity for there to be consistency across competition. And I say this, when you have inter and intrastate competition, you want fairness in everybody playing with the same types of rules. And so that's why Washington DC and Congress has been really important and we've made some strides. But I would also say that, you know, it's not probably ready for public consumption now. We are thinking about a plan B if we can't get help from Washington DC because that's, I think, the biggest uh, difficulty that our coaches are, are faced with. But it's not going away and nor should it go away. So this isn't like the NIL at some point is not gonna be around anymore. We need to continue to do it. And the final thing I'll say is I want us to continue to make sure literacy is a very important part across our campuses and within the conference that our student athletes are understanding their opportunities, their brand, and they may engage or they may not engage, but they have that opportunity. Take our next question in the back with our television folks. Pete Yannity from WSPA TV in Spartanburg. Two quick ones. A year ago in this room, you were answering questions about the future of the league. You just addressed that you hear the 
the talk about the financials, what steps maybe have been taken in the past year to have a better pathway forward for the conference, and then if I could also just have you give a synopsis as to how the CW package came together and how quickly that was all done to get where you are with that. Yeah, thanks, Pete. I, I would say this, uh, the league is healthy. It, it just is. And certainly there's rumblings, again, we all saw what happened in the springtime, but the group has come together in a way, uh, to me, that demonstrates they want to work together to find solutions. And your question about what solutions have, a, have has the conference uh, come forward with, well, we've worked with Fishbait on our eight-point plan, generating new additional revenue. The ESPN partnership is really strong, and ESPN and the ACC are completely motivated together to generate additional dollars. You see that the conference presidents and chancellors have initiated the success initiative, in, in, success in, incentive initiative, which is going to distribute dollars in a disproportionate way. We've never gone down that road before in the ACC, and I'm not sure many conferences have. And so revenue generation continues to be a priority. But let me be clear also, this league is third right now in revenue as we go forward into where, wherever the next TV deals are for other conferences. We've looked at it, we've had multiple TV consultants are. Third, and, uh, third is certainly a good position, but we want to gain and, and, and gain traction financially in order to close the gap with obviously the, the SEC and the, and the Big Ten who have leapfrogged everyone. I think one of the presidents said it best. Are we chasing a dollar amount or are we chasing success? And I think there's a difference there. If you're chasing a number, it takes you down a different path. If you're chasing success competitively in football and basketball and all of our sports, then I think every institution has an idea of what they need. So again, I, I feel really strongly about this league and, and I think people are missing it when they're not paying attention to the results of how well the conference has done. So it will continue to be a priority and, and uh, certainly has the attention of everybody from our board on down. And then the CW uh, relationship. Listen, we, we've had a great relationship uh, with our TV partners. Um, you know, Raycom has been a wonderful partner of the, CC, uh, the ACC forever. And they were incredibly helpful along with ESPN in getting the CW and I think all of you understand distribution and eyeballs and, and being able to be visible in all of the regions that our schools are, but across the country. And that was one of the things when I came you know, almost, well, two and a half years ago, um, the frustrations that we had about, I can't find my team. I can't find some of the games. And so they came in and uh, took the place of Bally's, who we appreciate the relationship that we have, and uh, um, Raycom will produce the games, and they'll be distributed on the CW, and CW is getting into sports, et cetera. I know they, they, you know they have Live Golf, and that, that's getting a lot of attention for different reasons, but we are really excited about that. I think Dennis Miller was gonna try to be here from the CW from Los Angeles. I'm not sure he's here, but um, if he is, maybe raise your hand, and, and uh, if you have any questions later, you can kind of go over and see him. But excited about the CW. I'm going to take our next question from our left-hand side in the middle. Hey, Commissioner. David Hood with TigerNet.com. In, in talking about the revenue gap versus the results and, and trying to find more money and working with ESPN, how do you keep the schools like Florida State, like Clemson that have spoken out publicly, uh, committed while trying to bridge what may be a, at some point a $40 million gap? And do you think that that gap can be bridged, maybe not to $40 million, but hey, we can get you to within $15 million, $20 million? I think that's the, the right approach to, to make it. Instead of trying to get to a number, try to bridge it as far as you can. And I think how you get it done, you work collaboratively. And that's what, that's what we've done. And those two institutions have been terrific to work with. I mean, they have great leadership. Rick McCullough is a wonderful guy. Jim Clemens is a wonderful guy. They love sports. They love their institutions. But they, I know they also love the ACC and are trying to figure a way through.
but it's all of our schools, right? All of our schools are incentivized to make sure that we have as healthy of a financial portfolio as we possibly can. So um, after the spring, if you wouldn't, have, you know, if we wouldn't have had any discussions or we wouldn't have come out with a success incentive initiative program, I, I may have felt differently, but the regularity of which the board is meeting now and the regularity of our ADs meeting, et cetera, and how good ESPN has been, they understand the volatility that there is, but they also are looking to grow financially based on some of their you know, recent events. So you have a lot of mutu mutually beneficial uh, outcomes in this thing. So staying together, working collaboratively, working strategically. And we have some other things that we're working on. I, I can't address with this group right now that are pretty exciting to try to address that revenue gap. Take our next question from the back on the aisle. Hey, Jim, David Hale with ESPN. Uh, you talked about lobbying the, uh, in, in D.C. regarding NIL. I know some of the uh, potential options that are out there would include a third-party government uh, entity that would oversee this. How comfortable are you with the idea of sort of outsourcing NIL oversight to a third-party government-run organization? Well, we've got to look at all of our options. If that ends up being the best one and everybody is, you know, in line with that, then, then you have to do it then you have to do it. It starts to get, you know, you start to get leakage about kind of controlling your organization and the association and making decisions when you go to Washington. So there's always some danger there. Um, but we have to do some things differently. And so if it ends up being in that kind of structure as you described, David, then we're going to have to do it. Let me take our next question. Nope, come on back up here. We're going to take our next question. Third row. Hi, right, Kenton Gibbs, Locked On ACC. Um, you, talk, you talked a lot about uh, where you are in terms of a conference and, and looking at growing and expanding and bridging that gap. One of the biggest fish that's out there that people constantly whisper about with the ACC, a team that's on that slate of televised games for the ACC is Notre Dame. Is there any progress towards getting Notre Dame to join as a full member with football as well, or is that not something that's on the table at the moment? Yeah. Another really good question. We, we've had a lot of conversations, let me just put it bluntly, with Notre Dame. And they've been very clear. They, they value their independence. Uh, and I think they feel strongly that that will continue well into the future. If they ever have the desire of joining the conference, they know that there's a, we would welcome them with open arms. But I think, you know, I can't speak for, for Jack right now and Pete in the future or, or Father John. Uh, but I think it's been a healthy relationship both ways for the ACC and for Notre Dame. Um, their sports, their, other than football, I think have thrived in the ACC. I think they really enjoy the academic prowess that the ACC brings as well. Uh, but they've been pretty clear about their desire to stay independent. So I don't see that changing anytime soon. Next question on the other side of the aisle, midway back. Hey, Jim, Luke DeCock, Raleigh News and Observer. Curious, you mentioned the, the revenue distribution and all those things. Did kind of having all of that come out at Amelia Island into the open with everybody discussing it change in your mind the sort of mood in the conference about some of this stuff? Was there a tangible change since May in terms of addressing the future of the ACC um, that, that you saw? Luke, I really believe it helped us. I do. It was painful to go through. Um, nobody liked it. But it really started to develop this honesty and candor. Not that it hasn't been an honest group before, but, but more candor than anything else about, hey, here are the issues we have, or here's what we're concerned about. And I think that's healthy. I think that's healthy in organ any organization. And you can maybe have, to have it at the coach level or at the AD level, but when it's at the CEO level, with our presidents and chancellors, um, I think that, ha that has helped us come together and understand these are some of the things that we have to address. And then, as I mentioned a little bit ago, I think the frequency, Luke, of us now getting together, we, we meet once a week now, um, you know, sometimes more, 
uh, and then, you know, if we don't have anything to go over, we can cancel the meeting, but it's on our, uh, on our uh, CEO schedule. Um, and even throughout the summer, we've had, to me, more meetings than my first two summers with the league by far, I think double. Uh, even combine the first two years. So they're attentive, they're aware, there's lots of discussion going on. So at the end of the day, uh, I think you turn a, a tough situation into a positive one. Take our next question from the back on our right-hand side in the aisle. Hey, hey, Jim, Matt Baker with the Tampa Bay Times, over here. Hey, how are you? Um, you were talking about the patchwork of NIL state laws. What in your mind is kind of the practical impact of that, considering there hasn't been much enforcement of anything so far? I think that's the disappointing part of it, Matt. And, and I think our league had the most visible one, and, and I, I just, I, I still kind of shrug my shoulder on that. I, I don't quite understand that, of everything that's going on. Um, at the end of the day, I think we have paralyzed the enforcement staff, not intentionally, but with state NIL laws. And they're not sure exactly the enforcement abilities that they have, et cetera. That's why some kind of consistent language across the country would allow our enforcement staff, to me, to be um, a lot more successful in doing the work that they need to do. So I think that's part of the earlier question of you know the frustrations of the coaches, et cetera, that they have in our athletic directors and even chancellors. Um, and it causes some disruption in your own league with our 10 states because they all look different, the laws do. So I'm hopeful we can get there, I really do. And I, I think we've made a ton of progress over the last two or three months. And a lot of us have almost lived in Washington, D.C. because of the frequency of meetings with both sides of the aisle. So I am cautiously optimistic that we can get something done. Next question, we're gonna stay in the back on the right-hand side. Hi, Jim, Joe Obias. The, I, understand the belief that they're students, not employees, but are there contingencies that you've discussed with the presidents or other commissioners in the likely event that the courts decide differently in the next couple of years? You have to be ready for anything, Joe. You know that. This is a, this is a fluid, changing landscape. And what a student athlete and their experiences and you know, being able to uh, get support and monetize their name, image, and likeness, what that looked like 10 years ago versus today, uh, I, we, we have to be ready for almost anything. The courts have been active all the way up to the Supreme Court, so it, it would be naive uh, for us to think that, hey, we can just kind of do this thing ourselves without much interference. So we'll have to continue to look at it. I know that that is not the desire of the ACC presidents at all, um, but it, you know, at some point could be a reality. Next question down here right in the front on the second row. Commissioner. With the college football playoff expanding, um, you mentioned the non-conference schedule. For example, Florida State, they have upcoming home-and-home -home games with Alabama and Georgia, two of the top programs in the country right now. With the playoff expanding, do you anticipate more of these home-and-homes in the future, and how can that help lift the profile of the ACC as a whole? I, th I think they go together. They're, they're interconnected. And with the expanded playoff, I think you're going to see more of those kinds of games because you can, you can suffer a loss, and maybe even two, and still get into a 12-team playoff. So, you know, the, the, the unique thing about scheduling is it, it's done individually, so the conference office doesn't have a lot of um, influence on it. You know, we can, we've tried to set up some games like we did in Ireland, which will be great, that's a conference game. But uh, I commend our schools that are playing difficult non-conference games. And what I'd like to see in the selection moving forward is there being you know, more emphasis on the games that you are playing, right? And what's the totality? What's the resume look across a 12-game schedule? Not just what you've done in your own conference, but who have you played in the non-conference schedule? So look forward to those games and many more that you've described. We're gonna take our final question right over here on the aisle. Jim David Teal from the Times-Dispatch in Richmond. How close are you and your fellow commissioners to finalizing the revenue distribution from the expanded playoff? And what impact will that have on what formula you eventually finalize for you, your success initiative? Yeah, I, those also kind of go hand in hand, David. Um, no, we don't know all the financials just yet of some of the postseason, so that's gonna work into it. 
but I know that the, the group is eager to get this finished. I, this is not a, another year away or anything like that. We're going to input it next year. I think they really are interested in, in a short order, getting something done and structured in a way so everybody kind of knows what those financials potentially look like, not knowing all the numbers. Um, so I, I would say a more near term than longer term. Appreciate that. I know that I'll see a bunch of you throughout the next couple days, but let me at this time invite our partners from the ACC network to the stage for a special announcement. Where is our ACC and family members? As they make their way up here, and with the ACC football season kicking off in 37 days, here's a quick video.